Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Pierre and I am a user experience researcher at Stadia Games and Entertainment. I am really excited to talk to you all today about our process for integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion into our game development. I'm going to start this talk by walking through some background and definitions on how we came to understand the role that diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, plays in our work and why it's important. And then I'm going to spend the second half of the talk walking through a little bit of how we created the rubric itself or the resource for integrating DEI and what we did to ensure that this rubric has had impact so far um, and makes sense for all of our core stakeholders. So first I wanted to give a quick overview of what I will be covering and won't be covering in this talk. I will be covering the process for reviewing our game development rubric and for understanding DEI and the role it plays in our process. I'll also be discussing core resources and concepts that informed this work. And I'll also give a brief overview of the impact that this resource has had to date. But what I won't be covering in this talk is a specific deep dive into the rubric details or the specific product integrations. And the reason for this is that we are actually still in an iterative stage where we're continuing to collect data as we test out this rubric and finalize it. Um, so the specific details aren't quite ready to share yet, but we're hopeful that the process of creating it and the types of questions that we've been addressing and challenges that we've been addressing in this process will be useful. And the hope is that once we're able to finalize this over the next several months, we can come back with a much deeper dive into the rubric specifics. So first, let's cover a bit of background. For those of you who aren't familiar with Stadia, we are Google's video game organization. And what makes us distinct from other video game orgs is that we are cloud-based, which means we are completely console-less and we combine a video game platform, a producer, and a publisher. So there are two main sectors of Stadia. Stadia the platform, which works on a lot of our hardware and the specific infrastructure for running our platform. And then there's Stadia Games and Entertainment, where we're actually making and producing games. And I work in the Stadia Games and Entertainment section. Our mission, more broadly, is to expand the creation, access, and enjoyment of groundbreaking entertainment that's powered by all the wonderful resources that we have available at Google. So one of the first things that we needed to do as a team when we started addressing the issue of needing a more actionable way to integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion, or a DEI into our game development process was aligning on a specific conceptual definition, really understanding what we were talking about when we used the term DEI. So here's a quick overview of that concept. Diversity is the representation of different identities and differences, both individually and collectively as a society. And one way to think about this in the video game context is having access to a wide variety of characters from different racial or ethnic backgrounds, for example, or different genders or sexualities. Then equity is fair treatment, equality of opportunity, and fairness in terms of accessing information and resources. So that's really building on the diversity piece and ensuring that in addition to having access to diverse characters, for example, within the video game context, you're also able to access different formats within the way that you create your character. So a more concrete example of this is when you put together different avatars or select different character pieces, for example, and character customization, that regardless of what you look like or your background, you're able to equitably access different types of hairstyles or different type of, types of skin tones that match what you look like or match your preference for play. Then inclusion builds on these previous two pieces to really ensure that by achieving an appropriate amount of diversity and equity in your product or process or concept or society, um, you're able to also cultivate a culture of belonging where everyone feels like they actively belong. So in the video game context, this means that all of the players that are coming to play our games and engage with our platform really feel that we are building and designing games for them and that serve them and that they're able to play in a way that makes sense for them and matches and aligns with their preferences.
And I added one additional concept here of product inclusion to really give a sense of how we are thinking about these abstract contexts in a more tangible way that uh, relates to our day-to-day -day roles. So product inclusion is our company-wide approach for really integrating the needs and considering the needs and perspectives of diverse users in our product development process. So throughout that whole product pipeline. And when we were thinking about how to ensure that we could integrate DI actionably into our work, we decided that product inclusion is a really great concept to lean on and build upon to make sense of our work. The next major step beyond identifying and defining DEI for ourselves was really understanding how that fits into our larger stadium mission. So as I mentioned before, our mission is to expand the creation, access, and enjoyment of groundbreaking interactive entertainment. And we really saw DEI as a core part of each of these pieces of the mission. So creation, access, and enjoyment can't fully be realized if that's not actually being fulfilled in the sense of all players and everyone who would like to engage with our games and interactive experiences. So we're really thinking about how DEI, um, looking at our process through a DEI lens, helps us understand how to create games for all players, how to ensure that our games are accessible for all players, and how to ensure that all players can really enjoy our products and our games and our platform um, in a way that really works for them and where they can feel included. So considering all of this, we started to think more concretely around how to integrate DEI into our day-to-day -day processes in terms of how we were identifying and understanding the success and the incre incremental development of our games. And we found that there was already some really fantastic accessibility criteria that were developed and put in place to ensure that our games were physically and cognitively accessible for players. But we needed some additional criteria to help really round out that process and that understanding to plug in the psychological accessibility piece. So we integrated these DEI criteria, identified and integrated them to ensure that our games are physically, cognitively, and psychologically accessible for players to really get at this creation, access, and enjoyment piece. So taking a step back a little bit from the specific needs on Stadia, we also needed to look into and identify and better articulate why DEI is important for video games more broadly. And through more extensive literature reviews and informal stakeholder interviews and a couple of different pieces that I'll talk through a little bit later in this talk, we were able to identify three core reasons why DEI is important for video games. First, it's crucial for avoiding harm. Second, it supports our underrepresented players. And third, it is imaginative and transformative. So in terms of it being crucial for avoiding harm, this really aligns with probably the most basic understanding of DEI and what comes to mind most frequently when thinking about DEI issues. And that's around things like avoiding the basic harm of being faced with stereotypical materials when you're playing a game or when you're interacting with different forms of media. So we know from previous decades of research that stereotypes can often originate in harmful assumptions about and depictions of different groups of various kinds, and that they don't just stay in a particular time period or place that many modern depictions can inadvertently draw from historical stereotypes. And this is a problem that doesn't only exist in more traditional forms of media like movies and books, but it's also applicable and continues to persist in video games. There's a really interesting study that showed that representation in video games can affect things like racial judgment um, in other areas of media and in life. And because of these issues, underrepresented players and underrepresented groups can often face higher difficulty feeling included in video game spaces. A quick way to look at this um, in terms of a more concrete example are the ideas of the Mammy, the Sapphire, and the Jezebel. These are three very well-researched and well-known examples of core representations of Black women that have persisted over time and across multiple different media mediums. If you have ever seen a 
depiction of an overly complacent or relatively meek, um, matronly black mother figure. That's a really great example of the mammy. Um, the stereotypical angry black woman can often be tied back to the sapphire type of representation or stereotype. And the Jezebel is really tied to particular hypersexualized or oversexualized depictions of black women. And a lot of the really great research that's been done across media studies as well as video game studies has been able to help us better understand how these media representations continue to cyclically perpetuate and present themselves in different forms of media that we interact with each day. And I called this to mind in particular to help us think through what some of the challenges are that we're still facing as video game creators and designers, and to think about what this means more broadly for um, thinking through the player base and about our player base in an intersectional way as well. So this is a great representation or example of a mix of both underrepresentation and misrepresentation issues that women in particular face when engaging with and interacting with video games. It was found that only 5% of video games at E3 um, in 2019 last year included female protagonists. And often, even when these female protagonists did appear, they were hypersexualized, treated as propped or props, or treated as victims of violence. And recent, a recent study in human-computer interaction work also found that additionally 90% of black female char characters and 45% of white female game characters are treated specifically as props or victims of violence in popular video games. So we're seeing here that there are continual layers of under and misrepresentation that are happening in games, um, and this is a core reason why integrating DEI actionably into our work can help us understand the challenges, identify the problems, and help resolve them. I want to emphasize specifically based on some of the examples that I talked through on the previous slide that intersectionality is a really important concept to be working with when trying to integrate and articulate the need for DEI in our work because we can use it as a framework to understand how different identities layer and intersect, which often present even heightened challenges that these groups might be facing. So using intersectionality as a framework for integrating DEI into our work can really help us um, most inclusively think through um, the marginalized or underrepresented populations that we may be engaging with as we build and design our games. The last point I want to touch on here in terms of how DEI is important for avoiding crucial harm or avoiding harm more generally is that video games have always been a space for self-expression and identity exploration. And they, there are really positive gains from interacting with video games, again, demonstrated in a really wide and vast array of research. And we can help really emphasize and highlight this piece and ensure that our players are engaging with the positive aspects and experiencing our game spaces and platforms as a positive space for all players by not perpetuating some of the existing inclusion issues that they may be facing and seeing in other forms of media. So a second major reason why DI is important for games is that it supports underrepresented players. So building on this piece of needing to flag and resolve different stereotypical issues or media perpetuations that we've seen across different forms of media, by consciously integrating DEI into our work, we can help achieve a better balance in the types of stories and perspectives and insights that are heard and that are also valued um, throughout our platform and throughout the way in which we surface different characters and narratives. In this way, we can help make our own organization a space that's known for innovation and inclusiveness. And we can really help push the industry forward, especially as a newer game company, to really ensure that this is a core part of our process and something that's clearly and publicly facing important. And lastly, I wanted to touch on the idea that DI is important because it is imaginative and transformative. Um, as a team, we really talked about the fact that we are at a crucial crossroads, especially as a new or developing and emerging space in video games. And so we can help use DEI to promote stories and ideas that may not have been highlighted before, either at all or appropriately. And so by using DEI as an actionable point 
in all of our game development processes. We can he really help transform our industry. And hopefully this talk can help inspire many of you to find ways to integrate this into your own work as well. So during the next half of this talk, I will focus on the rubric itself in terms of how we identified core goals based on a lot of this background work in terms of understanding what DI is, what some of the challenges are in the video game space and in me the media space more broadly, and then I'll move into how it's being used currently and what sort of impact the, this resource and this rubric has had to date. So in answering all of these questions and challenges that I've highlighted in the last few slides, our Stadia Games and Entertainment research team developed a DEI rubric that uses product inclusion and inclusive design, which is the design method that's core to product inclusion. We use principles from those two concepts to ensure that our games are psychologically accessible for all players. And two of the core goals that are associated with this work are preventing identity-based barriers to play. So ensuring that regardless of the background or identity or needs of our players, that they are able to play equitably and that they find an inclusive and welcoming space on our platform and in our games. And that beyond that, there, we're also able to identify and encourage for our developers different considerations and ways for proactively including in our players. And a lot of this centers on providing more customizable experiences for our players so that they can really arrange and identify and engage with ways um, to play our games in ways that make most sense to them. So some of the key steps for creating the rubric and a quick look at the process for creating this resource. It first started out with problem scoping, which actually covered a lot of what was reviewed in the first half of this talk. So through informal stakeholder interviews and moving into different forms of literature review, we were able to better understand what the problem space was, so what some of the challenges were in terms of DI concerns in video games and the concerns and challenges around integrating that into our process meaningfully, and especially what that can mean for people's different roles as they approach the game development process. Then we moved into goal setting and resource structuring where we used an externally focused and internally focused literature review to understand the landscape of DI and product inclusion, design more broadly and media representation to help structure the particular resource that we were building and identify the kind of best way to go about that, as well as what the core goal should be in the service of the player. Then we moved on to feedback gathering where we worked with the different teams to have them review the rubric in different forms and ask particular questions, provide feedback and insights in terms of how feasible it was in different forms to integrate into our process or what kinds of questions or possibilities it wasn't yet um, integrating or taking into account, especially regarding the very cross-functional needs and perspectives of our team. And then lastly, the stage that we're currently in is the socializing stage, where we've presented this work to our internal team, our organization more broadly, as well as our product area. Um, and through these different presentations, we were able to use this as an educational opportunity, but also as continued feedback gathering and, and continued testing of this resource and rubric. So we're continuing now to collect feedback from our cross-functional stakeholders, collect active player feedback to help really improve this rubric, test it out and validate it, and ensure that it's going to work um, long-term for our game development process. So what sorts of resources informed this rubric? There were a few different core categories that did. The first is existing Google resources. We were able to, as I mentioned before, really lean on a lot of the great product inclusion resources, um, diversity resource, resources and diversity research that exist across our company as a basis for the particular methods that we were gonna use and how we were going to integrate this into product development more broadly. Then we were able to use academic literature in areas like socially inclusive design and user-centered game design to better understand the core principles that we should be folding into the rubric itself and the formation of the core criteria. And lastly, we were able to use nonprofit and public organizations as well as think tank resources to really identify and articulate what's already known about media representation challenges and core parts of media representation and media literacy to help us better structure um, and provide a foundational format for the rubric itself.
How is it being used currently? So we are using this rubric as a core part of our user experience research or UXR game milestone evaluation process. So we have a core framework that we use that's developed also by our research team to ensure that we can assess a game's quality and success and usability as well as the level of fun in those games at different milestone checkpoints and different phases of the game development process. And we've now integrated core DEI questions as a foundational part of that process as well. So that we ensure that we are connecting inclusivity, diversity, equity, and inclusion as a way to and as part of the markers for success and quality of the games that we're working on. And in terms of the specifics, of what that looks like in practice. We use the rubric to flag and resolve different DEI issues that may come up in our build reviews or in our play testing. And we also, again, as I mentioned before, use this to promote proactive inclusion. So really use the rubric to highlight and surface different opportunities and considerations that our developers can take in mind to really surface ways for players to engage with our games in ways that mo make most sense to them and can really address their needs, um, regardless of how diverse the player base is. In terms of applying the rubric, we use a couple of different formats currently, or a couple of different key methods. The first is heuristic evaluations, which usually take place more internally on our research team. We also actively use playtests throughout each game milestone, where we really heavily rely on player feedback um, to help us understand and gauge what some of the core challenges are that we still need to resolve or what's working really well for serving our players needs. And then lastly, we're also using this rubric for internal cross-functional reviews um, where we bring together our many different perspectives and approaches to ensure that um, any DEI concerns that are arising are resolved. This is a quick snapshot of what the process integration looks like so far. So at our key stages of game development, all the way from the initial concept phases through to the active production phases, and then uh, close to the launch phase when it's live and accessible for players and published, we have key questions that we're asking around DI and around product inclusion more broadly to first ensure that our developers know what needs to be considered and that we're talking through and articulating some of the core considerations um, that really respect and highlight our player needs and perspectives. Then we ensure that there's a concrete plan in place for addressing the physical and psychological accessibility that's needed for our players. And from that point onward, we have various checkpoints where we continue to answer the question, is the overall game physically and psychologically accessible? And we use our player feedback and our internal reviews with the help of the guiding rubric to answer that question over time. So the last thing I wanted to touch on is what sort of impact that this resource has had to date. So it's mainly had impact in terms of education and process. In terms of education, we've been able to use this as a tool for talking about DEI and for helping people think through how to make sense of DEI in their day-to-day -day roles by presenting it, the rubric itself, at various venues across both our teams at Stadia and Google more broadly. And in terms of process, we're actively using this for game evaluations. We've concluded quite a few product inclusion reviews so far and are using that data to actively iterate on the rubric um, and find different gaps that we can continue to work on to improve it. We've also integrated it into our leadership review process. We're at each of the milestones for our games. We're really concretely and actionably considering DI and taking it into mind in terms of determining the success and the quality of the game over time um, and ensuring that it's really gonna serve all of our players. Then lastly, it's also been used as a catalyst for different additional collaborations and partnerships across our team. So thinking through how different cross-functional roles can start to use DEI or continue to use DEI in their work. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're currently in a very deep iterative stage where we're continuing to use the data that we're getting back from play testers and active testing and feedback internally and externally to continue to improve and start to finalize this rubric. So I want to end on the note that you can do this as well. So 
one of the major goals of this talk is to really outline what the process might look like in terms of thinking through and understanding how DEI can play a role in your work and how you can use this um, as a core part of your game development process. So a quick overview of that is that you can first define product inclusion for your area. So really think through what are the different methods that um, your company might already be using or other companies are using to think through DEI actionably and meaningfully in your day-to-day -day work. Um, what's, and how can you define that as a team that makes sense for all of your roles? And then continue to iterate those definitions and that alignment with your cross-functional stakeholders as you start to develop any sort of resource to integrate this and make sure that it makes sense and is usable for all of your team. Then you can plan for process integration. That's a huge part of success of any of these types of resources is ensuring that there's a way to slot this into existing process and make sure that it's going to be meaningfully used and integrated and that users' voices are truly going to be considered throughout. And lastly, a final piece is to socialize this type of work widely as a way to continue to iterate, to fill gaps, um, and to really strengthen and solidify the approach, the structure, um, and the overall understanding and use of that, that type of resource. And with that, thank you so much for your time.